Greetings Guardians, my name is Bife here. As recently as in the Season of the Deep, we saw a part of the Taken King's legacy appearing in dramatic terms. The sudden discovery of Oryx's sunken corpse was by far the most remarkable thing to have been discovered deep beneath the waves of Titan, Arsa not included. But more remarkable still was that some of the most powerful combatants that we'd ever seen within his horde were risen as Hive Guardians. To some, this is just another way of introducing an enemy in the battle and yeah, you know, you have a cool named enemy that's a throwback, but the implication for the wider activities of the Lucent Hive are clear as day. To recover the bodies of Oryx's dead faithful, they would need to get a foothold on Oryx's former flagship, the Dreadnought. It's to this massive ship that I want to turn our attention today. The Dreadnought is possibly the single most important Hive asset in the entire system, alongside Savathun's flagship, the Lure, any remaining vessels of Zivor Wrath and the Hellmouth. And yet, as best we know, it has been abandoned by Guardian forces since the onset of the Red War. Whilst there's meta-narrative context to this, there's also a stark reminder here of what our Guardians could have accomplished. We'll explore all of this today as I talk about the missed opportunity, both in storytelling terms and in terms of what our Guardians could be doing that is represented by the Dreadnought. So I imagine there are at least a few newer players who don't know what the Dreadnought is. To keep it really brief, it is a massive hive ship, but the reality is that explaining what the Dreadnought is requires us to go much deeper. So excuse this, it is actually going to have to get long. It was originally created by Oryx, the Taken King. Oryx was one of the original three major hive gods that swore allegiance to darkness with the worm gods on fundament. You'll definitely know of his two sisters, Savathun and Sivuar Rath. You have seen them in Destiny in the last couple of years or so, they've been very prominent in the story, and they have been the major leaders who have been trying to control the Hive. As is the case with all Hive that become powerful enough, Oryx had a throne world, a cyst within the universe where he would retreat if he was killed in our reality. Throne worlds are like pocket dimensions, but they're built to the specifications and beliefs of their creator, influenced by their will and their philosophy. This means that they can effectively be turned into fortresses if that is what the individual desires. And they're also especially important because the only way to kill someone who has a throne world for good is to kill them in their throne world. At a certain point in time, thanks to some hijinks involving Oryx's son Crota, Savathun's manipulations and a bunch of invading Vex, Oryx's throne world was invaded and compromised. The weakness exposed by the Vex and his son was one that might be exploited by his foes and rival Hive alike, so Oryx sought a solution. The first part of that solution was throwing his son into the Vex gate network and telling him come home glorious or die forgotten, so that was fun, but the real solution was to turn his throne world inside out and merge it with physical space. More specifically, he would merge it with a massive hive vessel the likes of which had potentially never been seen before. This vessel would be the Dreadnought. It's important to understand how absolutely monumental this is for the hive as both a display of power and in a cultural sense. The Dreadnought is a paradox in reality, it should not exist. But Oryx was so powerful as the Taken King that reality could be bent to his will. Granted, Oryx wasn't alone in this endeavor. He enlisted the help of his court. The court of Oryx at this time included some of the most powerful Ascendant Hive in existence. It even included Balwa, a daughter of Savathun, his sister. Together, all of these Ascendant Hive would join in rituals as they turned Oryx's cyst universe, his throne world, inside out, filling the space that was the massive hive vessel with Oryx's own pocket dimension. This would also have a cultural impact on the hive at large. The hives still celebrate the creation of the Dreadnought with a festival known as Eversion Day, which is horrifically celebrated by the hive through the practice of turning things inside out. And to clarify, that doesn't sound bad until you remember that the hive don't wear socks. The hive are not turning their clothes inside out, the hive are probably turning living things inside out. They have a penchant for violence and witchcraft, so one can imagine this grim sight. 
all inspired by the creation of Oryx's Dreadnought. But more than just this, the Dreadnought was forged, at least in part, using the remains of the worm god Akka that Oryx had killed long ago to acquire the secret of communing with what he interpreted to be the darkness. He also armoured his ship in baleful armour using the stolen Hammer of Sivor Wrath and Scalpel of Savathun. Each of these components is symbolic and was probably chosen with a purpose. It's hard to understand if there is a literal or metaphorical sense to what the scalpel and hammer were, but either way, it's more about who owned them in this instance. Oryx has just shown with the creation of the Dreadnought that he has supremacy. By stealing the scalpel and hammer from Savathun and Zivorath, he shows supremacy over his two siblings. By armoring the Dreadnought, at least in part using the remains of the worm god Arka, he shows his supremacy as taken king over the worm gods. By using these implements to craft his vessel, and even turning it inside out, Oryx was sending a message. In Hive political terms, the Dreadnought would always stand as a testament to not only Oryx's power, but still his supremacy over Zivor Wrath, Savathun, the worm gods, and even the universe itself. I don't often talk about the political intrigue and machinations in Destiny, because honestly, I don't think the writers lean into it as much as they could, and I kind of wish they did. However, I think this moment, as it's portrayed in the lore, absolutely reeks of these factors. I don't often talk about the political intrigue and machinations in Destiny, but this move by Oryx absolutely reeks of those factors. You may not quite understand what I mean by that, I know the word politics, getting involved in anything, immediately sets off some people's alarm, but what I mean by that is just purely the display of power within Oryx's own people, and I think it is absolutely fascinating. The reason why is because it, well, it reminds me of a bunch of times where that's been done in history or in fiction. And you know what, I think that the greatest example you can see comes from another great piece of fiction which is Game of Thrones. More specifically, the creation of the Iron Throne by Aegon the Conqueror. For those of you who don't know the story, when Aegon came to the Seven Kingdoms, they were all squabbling, had no single ruler, and there was a loose set of alliances at times, but realistically it was Seven Kingdoms, Seven Monarchs, and Aegon set out to conquer all of them. When Aegon inevitably defeated all of his foes, he not only demanded that they swear fealty to him, but also he demanded that they surrender their swords. Now, this is an important thing, because not only is it a symbol of power, but also it removes your enemy's ability to fight back. It is a claim of supremacy. But what Aegon did is what's so similar to the Dreadnought, because he didn't just take those swords and then have them stored somewhere for his own forces to use, he took all of them and melted them down in dragon's fire to make a throne, the Iron Throne. This is kind of like the Dreadnought. Both of them are symbols of power, a practical response to potential conflict given that the Dreadnought was originally made because Oryx's throne world had a perceived weakness, and it is a direct shot across the bow at his rivals, reminding them that he is their superior and that they owe allegiance to him. Oryx's Dreadnought is his Iron Throne, and it serves more purpose than just a chair, and it serves more purpose even than just removing certain aspects from his enemies. It is supremacy, embodied. Incredible as this is though, Oryx knew that one day his dominion might come to an end. He saw only two outcomes by the final conclusion of the universe, which was either victory in the form of the perfect final shape, or death at the hands of the thing that would eventually form that final shape. Almost ten years ago from now, the Guardians would encounter Oryx as he entered the system of Sol for the first time. He may not have known it at this moment, but this would be the end for his story. His arrival was a moment that revealed yet more about the Dreadnought's staggering power though. At the Battle of Saturn, Queen Mara Sov and her paladins would command the Awoken Navy and would engage Oryx's armada. Oryx brought a sizable fleet with him, and at first things looked fairly contested. The battle even seemed to be turning in the Woken favour when Marasov deployed an ancient superweapon, entities called the Harbingers. These ancient beings would tear through the conventional vessels of the Hive, bringing great amounts of asteroid debris in their wake, and would all slam into Oryx's Dreadnought. Every vessel in Oryx's fleet was destroyed. 
the Dreadnought was completely unharmed. When they made contact, the Harbinger's assault was blunted completely. Their effect was negligible at best, and the debris left in the gravitational wake of the Harbingers would eventually clear. It's at this moment that Oryx began his counter. The weapon at the heart of the Dreadnought that Oryx fired that day is not completely understood, but from what we know, Oryx would essentially use his Dreadnought to momentarily unleash his throne world into real space. This massive pulse of energy cast everything in its wake aside and propelled outwards in all directions. The snub fighter vessels of the Corsairs and their massive elixney built catches buckled and broke under the devastation of this force, killing scores of awoken warriors and several high-ranking paladins in the moment. But the effect of this weapon might be even worse, because as this wave of energy from Oryx's own throne world was unleashed, Marasov didn't find herself killed. Instead, she found herself taken. If this is the power of the Dreadnought superweapon, at least under the control of Oryx, it should be really clear that this is one of the most powerful assets in the system today. Admittedly, it isn't clear if this weapon was bound to Oryx's throne world specifically, and the writing in which this happens doesn't make it clear that this was the final fate of everyone hit by the weapon. Regardless, when the engagement was finished, the Awoken fleet was destroyed, and Oryx's dreadnought was left still standing. Again, we don't know if this weapon could be used upon the moment of Oryx's death, but regardless, the potential for that weapon's power demands respect. The scar it left on Saturn's rings is as visible a sign of that power as any today. This power that Oryx was displaying was not to last. We would eventually manage to board his ship even as he attempted to fire the weapon a second time to destroy us on our approach and we would eventually kill him within the outer layers of the Dreadnought. We also traversed to its core and defeated him within its heart, allowing us to deal a truly fatal blow and kill off Oryx for good. But even after Oryx's death, the Dreadnought remained and it still represented a massive tactical asset for the Hive. Even if control of the Dreadnought was contested between Hive and Guardian forces, it would be territory that we would absolutely need to assert our authority over for the sake of the security of the system. There are a few examples of why this is, but I think it is best represented by the Bond Brothers. Originally hailing from one of the Cabal Scout Legions, the Cabal Bond Brothers were a pair of powerful high-ranking Cabal warriors. Their Primus had originally ordered the assault on the Dreadnought following his own orders from on high. He would take revenge against the force that had decimated the ranks of his legion. His plan was to crash their vessel, the Dantalian Exeter VI, into the Dreadnought and to assault Oryx directly. He even led the charge in this endeavor, something we managed to see and interrupt during the Taken King campaign. Clearly though, they had underestimated the stakes of this particular assault because the Primus was promptly taken and the Cabal were left in disarray. Shortly after Oryx's first defeat, this pair of Cabal commanders would decide to take revenge. They would storm the Dreadnought and make their way to its power core. They planned to threaten the Hive by holding the Dreadnought's core hostage. In theory, if their Primus wasn't returned to them, they would use explosives they'd brought to detonate the Dreadnought's core, killing everyone. Little did they know that such an action would have potentially destroyed half of Sol, this is according to Cade, who states that that's the amount of power it would release if destroyed. With such incredible stakes held in the balance, a strike team was dispatched to secure the location, and the Bond brothers were defeated. Simply the potential consequences of this one encounter, though, show us just how important securing the Dreadnought is. The fate of the entire system can hang in the balance, and this particular instance I described isn't because the Hive decided to use the weapon to its fullest, it's because the Cabal tried to sloppily destroy it. When utilized properly by any number of different Hive forces, the Dreadnought could be even worse, even more terrifying. But even just in an attempt to destroy it, it could be dangerous to the system. So therefore, it absolutely had to be secured. But then, the Red War happened. Guardians lost their light, and we were left on the back foot with all other priorities other than reclaiming the last city and the Traveler being of secondary importance. 
Whilst undoubtedly this was the correct priority at the time, it's still always been a mystery to me that we didn't hear much more about the Dreadnought sooner on. It's been in orbit above Saturn all this time, and to the best of my knowledge, Guardian fire teams have never been redeployed to secure it once again, despite its prior stated strategic relevance. Now, to be clear, there is definitely a because video game kind of response to this, which runs along the lines of the developers can only create or bring back so many areas. And there's also the point to be made that I'm sure some people would be absolutely sick of seeing yet another Destiny 1 location being ported back into the game. That's correct, fair, entirely valid, but equally I feel like we need to retake the Dreadnought if we have the vested interest that we're supposed to in system-wide security for humanity, especially considering that the Hive haven't gone anywhere and the Dreadnought is still capable of incredible power. Even if it is just an immensely large vessel in our hands, it would be advantageous to prevent it from falling into control of the Hive once again. To be fair, it's not as though we ever heard more about the Dreadnought. We only know a few facts about it from Destiny 2, and it's only been mentioned a few times here or there. There are entries in the lore where occasionally someone will look up and spy the Dreadnought from Titan. They don't really give us too much context. We know that the Guardians have at very least left individuals to monitor certain assets within Saturn's orbit, such as Oryx's continually floating corpse, which eventually was swallowed up by the gravitational rift that took Titan as best we know. However, the amount of information we had about the Dreadnought since Destiny 1 was still pretty scant. And well, I know this because I went looking for it. It's entirely possible I've missed a bunch of things, but to the best of my knowledge, there's only a few prominent times where it's been mentioned, the most prominent of which is in the season of the hunt. It's at this moment, just prior to when Osiris loses his light, that he would briefly infiltrate the Dreadnought as he attempted to understand what was going on with the Hive and the Cryptolifts appearing across the system. It was a success. I was able to reverse engineer the Hive's organic communication systems within the Dreadnought. I directly interfaced with their network of collective consciousness. Things I learned, Zavala. Things I learned. The hive is fractured, shattered, turned on itself. The Black Fleet intends to punish Zavathun for interfering with its efforts to communicate with us. No one knows where the Witch Queen is, not even her own court. And now Zivu Arath is using this opportunity to consolidate her power. I will return to the Reef tomorrow to confer once more with Spider. He says he has news for me. I just had the most interesting conversation with our friend Spider back out in the Reef. Not only did he already know about these hive structures, but he's found others on the tangled shore that my scanners missed. He claims some of his agents have gone missing, and there are rumors of disappearances among the houseless fallen as well. Sagira so patched into local cabal communications. Keitel's scouts noted unsettling discoveries among the Red Legion stranded in the system. Entire encampments abandoned. Evidence of internal conflict. Mass graves. Whatever is going on with these hive towers. We need an answer. I'm going to Saturn. I may have a way to find it within the derelict hulk of Oryx's dreadnought. Tell Saint he's missed. Whilst this is only a small glimpse into the Dreadnought's systems, it's clear that by accessing its technology, we can get an idea of what's going on with most of the hive swarm, at least in broad stroke terms. That kind of intelligence advantage is unbelievably valuable. Even if we only get, oops, I don't know, let's be generous and say half the picture of what's going on with the Hive, that's still somewhere between 49 and 50% more information than we had before. And all thanks to the Dreadnought's local systems and Osiris' discovery that we can tap into them. This all brings us back to the most recent mention of the Dreadnought, which is in the context of Oryx's elites, such as Ekthar being resurrected by Lucent Hive, as part of the Gambit to eventually resurrect the Taken King himself as a Lightbearer. Whilst there are no details on this operation, I think it's explicitly clear that in order to raise those Hive, the Ghost would have needed to travel to the place where they had died. 
Given that we killed Ekthar in the Dreadnought's deeper recesses, it's clear that this must have been a far-reaching operation. So with that brief history of the Dreadnought and the further understandings of the many reasons why it's so important, I think you can all start to see why it's such a missed opportunity that we don't hear more about it, and why it is incredible to me that we don't see more of it being brought up when it's clear that Hive have a definite interest in it and that it's still around. Now again, obviously the because video game point is relevant, and that might be the simplest explanation, at least in our sense, as to why we've not been there in Destiny 1. I think it's mad that we haven't heard more about it because of all the stated reasons above. And I think that honestly, now that we have the King's Fall raid back in the game, there has been no better time to continue to explore the Dreadnought and at very least have the occasional mission or sortie there if possible. More importantly, we also need to make sure, if we are concerned about the security of Sol generally, we stop it from falling into Hive hands. To give you an idea of what I mean, let's go ahead and imagine a scenario of what happens if the forces of Zivor Arath capture the Dreadnought definitively and regain full control of it. At minimum, they gained a powerful fleet asset that is incredibly resilient against outward assault. But that's something of the best case scenario where we naively assume that the Dreadnought is a mostly defunct ship at this moment in time. But as we know, the Dreadnought is much more than just a ship. It is a symbol, a mobile fortress, a potential system-destroying payload, a communications hub for the vast majority of the Hive, seemingly, and perhaps most terribly of all, it's filled with secrets. Let's talk about each of those. Zivu Arath claiming the Dreadnought would first and foremost lend her some sorely needed legitimacy. Being able to claim dominion over one of the Hive's greatest symbols of conquest and power would be potentially unifying, and could help shore up Zivo Arath's authority in the wake of her defeat and banishment from her own throne world by Eris Morn. A powerful vessel like the Dreadnought could also lend Zivo Arath further control over the system by providing her with a mobile but defensible location where she could concentrate her power once again, and even a fraction of the Dreadnought's weaponry being online would mean that we'd need to take it seriously. This is all assuming that she wouldn't be able to re-engage the terrifying superweapon that Oryx had enabled, and that somehow it has been destroyed alongside Oryx. But again, it's hard to understand. Assuming that she's able to move with the Dreadnought and be mobile and vigorous in her attempts to defend her territory, future boarding operations on the Dreadnought would be even trickier to undergo. If worst comes to worst, Zivo Arath could decide to also use the Dreadnought in a more directed and clumsy way against humanity, moving it to the center of the system, for example, and detonating its core, just like the Bond brothers did. It's something that might be unthinkable to the Hive, but in Zivo Arath's drive to secure victory at any cost, who knows, she might just be willing to do so. And if she did, she would probably take half the system with that detonation, meaning she would have a direct way to not only threaten, but utterly annihilate Earth, the Reef, and the majority of the Coalition. If what Osiris discovered about the communications and monitoring systems aboard the Dreadnought still holds true, then perhaps it also could lend a degree of additional logistical strength to anyone who conquers it. Let's say Zivor Rath does take it over. This might be a general point of Hive technology that we just don't understand that well, or it could be something that Zivu could use to reclaim and coordinate the more disparate broods of the Hive around Sol. That would be an incredibly important capital asset for the sake of organization. And lastly, as I was saying, the Dreadnought is filled with secrets. This place is full of undiscovered knowledge that Oryx must have left behind. Even after Guardians had thoroughly scoured the place for the few years that we had been able to board it, it's unlikely that we discovered everything. And even if things and even the few things we do know about are still potentially very dangerous. To give a few examples, we have the potentially terrible prisoners still sealed within the Hanging Crypts, who could potentially lend their aid to Zivo Arath. We have the possible remaining Tablets of Ruin, one of which was clearly stolen away to Savathun's throne world, as we found out in The Witch Queen, but if any of them do remain still within the possession of any who are on the Dreadnought, securing them prevents the Hive from taking control of one of the most powerful assets and potentially a guide map to how you are supposed to use the power to take. I don't think we want that falling into anyone else's hands, even if both Savathun and Zivor Rath have previously learned for themselves how to control the Taken. 
we also should consider Golgoroth's cellar, where a massive amount of stolen light has been stored that might be useful for hive experimentation or empowerment. And of course, at the heart of the Dreadnought lies the Court of Oryx itself, where the hive practiced the sword logic intimately and learned some of their greatest powers. Some of the more powerful Ascendant Hive that were tied to the Court of Oryx might still reside here and would still, again, be potential powerful assets for Zivu to leverage against us. But above all that, for Zivu specifically, we have to consider one further terrifying idea, which is that the power and the technology of the Dreadnought is a goldmine for her in her particular predicament. What predicament is that? Well, she was banished from her throne world. The Dreadnought, as you might recall, is a throne world and a paradox. It is a throne world turned inside out that is now within real space. If Zivu Arath is able to take control of the Dreadnought, Maybe in time she might be able to understand its construction more intimately, and if a ritual or the process of that ritual is discovered that would allow eversion to happen again, who's to say that Zivo Arath couldn't invert her own throne world and undo her banishment somehow? I have no idea if that's how any of this would work. The actual terms of her banishment are left exceedingly vague, as is the terms of the ritual that created the aversion of Oryx's throne world in the first place. But I'm not putting anything out of the realm of possibility. This is the problem with the Dreadnought. It breaks reality. It even breaks the paracausal laws that break reality in the first place. It is an enigma unto itself and terrifying in terms of the scope of its power. And if Zivor Arath was to reclaim the Dreadnought and somehow was able to prevent Eris' banishment from being functionally any different from what she was used to before, all of a sudden, we have a new problem on our hands. A newly resurgent hive who is the heir apparent to the throne now that Savathun has taken the power of the light. If Zivor Arath was even unable to control the Dreadnought like this, and she simply had a powerful piece of technology on her hands in the form of a giant ship, she might still be able to escape further into the remaining layers of Oryx's old throne world, decayed as they might be, so that she would be able to buy herself just a little more time. Yes, we might be able to pursue her further, but in the event of such an extreme assault, Zivor Arath would at least have one more place she could back into. Perhaps another corner, yes, but still, the ability to run sometimes can save your life. It should also be pointed out that there's the question of the Dreadnought's terrifying main weapon. The exact process by which it operates is still unclear. If it was linked intrinsically to Oryx or his throne world, which is likely, it may be defunct forever. But again, if Zivu Arath is able to use the Dreadnought properly, maybe this weapon can be reactivated. Even if it is only active at a fraction of its former power, it's enough to easily best any single vessel in combat, and is probably one of the most potent vessels within the entire system. Perhaps only the Cabal's almighty weapons platform, which was literally used to destroy the sun, would be something more deadly and more powerful. Perhaps only the defenses and weapons of the vessels of the Black Fleet and the Traveler would supersede it, and would be able to put up a fight against the Dreadnought's weapon. Taking a step back from hypotheticals, I think that one thing is still made clear. Regardless of who controls the fortress at this moment, the Hive are divided and weakened, and there has never been a better time for Guardians to go after the Dreadnought and secure it for good. There has also never been a more pressing time to do so. I've talked before about the looming power vacuums in Sol that would emerge if the Witness was to be defeated, and these power vacuums would be especially turbulent for the Hive. They would need a stabilizing influence, and we are now in a position to deny them the critical asset that might help them to do this. It's something that would keep reunification out of their grasp and would stop any leader who rises to claim it from legitimizing their power as they step into that power vacuum. We should prevent them from doing any of this. We should claim the Dreadnought if we know what's good for us. For all we know, the Dreadnought might be a bunch of dead weight in our hands, but we can tell for a certain fact that it's far safer with us in control than it is with Zivu Arath or Savathun in control. What's more, I can't not go back to the point of it being a legitimizing symbol. When Malok first rose in an attempt to potentially control the Taken, he arose on the Dreadnought before being forced to retreat to the moon. 
When the Dreadnought first arrived in the system, it did more damage to the Awoken people than any fallen house did, and laid the foundations for their eventual decimation by Riven. When the Dreadnought was created, it was a symbol of Oryx's true supremacy over not just the Hive, not just the Worm Gods, but potentially the universe itself. I am stunned that we've had the Hive's narrative equivalent of the Iron Throne sitting there this whole time, and nobody has seemingly decided to do anything with it. Regardless, I think one thing is clear. So long as the Dreadnought remains in Sol, so will the Hive, in one form or another. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, go ahead and leave a like. And if you have your own thoughts, leave them down below in the comments section. Remember that doing so feeds the algorithm and helps to keep my channel afloat. Also, if you are in the comments section, let me know. Do you reckon that the idea of Zivor Wrath potentially taking control of the Dreadnought is a future avenue for the story? Given that we know the Lucent Hive have already been there, would this create an interesting battleground for the Hive against other Hive? Let me know. I'm fascinated to hear your thoughts. But as per usual, know that your viewership, as always, is quite enough for me. And that in the meantime, my name has been, my name is Bife. Rodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside.